As for his place within white nativism, I see Peterson as the gateway drug to its harder forms, to those who call for direct discrimination against Muslims in the West, who champion Islamophobia, do sanction wars and bombing against Muslims abroad. He soft sells his political agenda through personal morality issues that chime with orthodox Muslim men. I have always been very critical of Muslim engagement with the progressive left because this has often led to silence over repugnant social positions. In some parts of the Muslim community, the right wing is treated very differently, possibly because there may be overlaps with current social concerns. The same criticism of those scholars that engage with the left can equally be applied to those that engage with the right. This new white nativist trend is fiercely anti-migrant, oozes Islamophobia and believes in a white chauvinism that resurrects ideas of ethnic and cultural hierarchy. I've noticed that some, mainly Muslim men it must be said, who are captivated by the likes of Jordan Peterson and give too much credibility to their superficial prescriptions that do not reflect the depth and detail of the Qur'an and the prophetic sunnah. Is there a problem with Muslim public intellectuals and scholars that engage with the political right? My guest this week, Yahya Burt, believes that white convert scholars that interact with the likes of Jordan Peterson or Roger Scruton should evaluate whether they risk confirming the anti-Islam prejudices and a distasteful pro-white ideology that today undergirds the populist white nativist backlash. In a recent piece he penned, Yahya Burt, a Muslim convert, is critical of those who belong to the neo-traditionalist school, an Islamic persuasion he shares, who need to ask more profound questions about their outreach activities with the right and whether by doing so they undermine second and third generation Muslims, sons and daughters of migrants who face racial and religious hatred in the mainstream. Yahya believes that although one needs to show due respect to scholars, this does not mean we must show them deference when they exhibit political naivety or confirm problematic political causes. Yahya Burt is a research director at the Ayan Institute in London and is a community historian who has taught at the University of Leeds. He has published over a dozen peer-reviewed articles on Islam in Britain and co-edited British Secularism and Religion, Islam in Victorian Liverpool and the Collected Poems of Abdullah Quilliam. Yahya Bed, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be on and um, I, I do appreciate the work that you do in raising the level of public Islamic discourse. Jazakallah khair, and really the pleasure is all mine. And um, uh, I'm today going to focus primarily on an article I read uh, that you published a few days back, and I'll put the, uh, the link in the show notes. And I think in the article, you very eloquently and persuasively argue uh, that there is a white nativist undercurrent developing in the West, and Muslims, particularly white converts, are not immune to its extremes. Uh, can you please spell out for our listeners what white nativism is, first of all? Because many, I suppose, deny its significance. And that's fair enough. Um, let, let me try and run through some of the main features of white nativism, um, both in terms of its ideas and white nativism as a movement. Um, so the first ideological feature really is a fear of demographic change. Um, and it's the idea that there will be a great replacement of white culture and white peoples by black and brown cultures or black and brown peoples uh, who are seen in this worldview as intellectually and morally inferior. Um, so this white nativist ideology, it tends to provide whites with a way to legitimize a shared past and a national identity that ignores and minimizes its history of colonialism and slavery and racial violence and discrimination. It is also used as glue, super glue, to overcome class antagonisms among whites themselves and replaces them with racial antagonisms instead. We should sort of caution that whiteness itself 
is not a biological fact, it's a constructed identity, and therefore it's a malleable or changeable legal and political category. Let me give you an example of Anglo-American whiteness. At one point, it was exclusively Anglo-Saxon, but over the centuries, it broadened to include Nordic and Germanic peoples, then the Irish, then the Mediterranean Europeans, the Italians, the Spanish, the Greeks, and at this very moment has been extended to Ukrainians. Yet at earlier points of history, these white people were stigmatized as foreigners and as inferior in ways similar to the racialization of brown and black peoples. Current white nativism is influenced by a theory which came out of France a decade ago called Great Replacement Theory, which plays on this idea that white culture or even white populations will be displaced or dominated by, by non-white cultures and populations. Um, and this, this theory that came out of France has gone global and has been found in the manifestos written by the Christchurch mosque attacker or heard in the chants of the American alt-right at the rally in Charlottesville a few years ago. In Europe, great replacement theory has become increasingly mainstream with tightening immigration and refugee controls um, and also in citizenship, especially after what was described as a Syrian refugee crisis. Every Muslim in the West contrasts the, the panic and the lurch towards the right with the Syrian refugee crisis with the current warm reception of Ukrainian refugees. If anything defines white nat nativism, it is a recourse to law to formally exclude non-whites. In Britain now, citizenship for non-white Britons is being chipped away at, as the Windrush scandal and the stripping of Shamima Begin's citizenship shows. White nativism has developed a youth movement wing, especially among young men, the identitarian movement in Europe and the alt-right in North America. White nativism or white nationalism or white supremacy is manifested in right-wing populism of recent years in the elections of Trump and Johnson, in the Brexit vote, in the emergence of quasi-fascist figures like Viktor Orban in Hungary. And white nativism is instituted in a wide range of powers that Western governments use in the surveillance and securitization of Muslim communities, turning them into suspect communities and seen as, a, as risky citizens, seen as a threat or a danger. And that is racialized and Muslims are profiled on the basis of appearance. Um, so given all of this, I don't see how it's possible empirically speaking to return to your question to deny the significance of white nativism, um, given all of these developments. I suppose you, you know the arguments. There are some who, who argue that um, white nativism is a political tool created by the progressive left uh, to undermine um, mainstream conservative positions. This is this, I guess, is what I would describe as a kind of Daily Mail or Fox News talking point. Um, uh, it's uh, I don't know really if it's worth answering that question. Um, mm. I think yeah. every serious Muslim intellectual, Muslim activist, acutely aware of the lurch to the right, because Muslim Muslims have been sort of the, in the West have sort of been canaries in the coal mine, as far as. Um, you know, this kind of uh, rising nationalism has it has been concerned because Muslims have been the internal and external enemies of this of this project. Um, uh, you know, particularly since nine eleven, and uh, I really don't see how it's unless we're going to put our heads in the sand. I don't think that's a credible argument. I, I want to come to your central argument about what you see as your responsibility as a white convert. But it seems to me that you're very uneasy about some Muslim public intellectuals and scholars and their close proximity to this white nativist trend. Uh, who are we talking about here? and What makes you uneasy about uh, their outreach programs? Let me say, first of all, that uh, in the essay, I take care to say that this is a general issue, not a convert only issue. Yeah. In other words, the appeal of white nativism is quite widespread now among some second and third generation Muslim men in the West of different ethnic backgrounds. I, I don't want to suggest at all that this is uniquely attractive to white converts, um, although some are attracted to it. 
So the real problem is our confusion about the relationship of religious orthodoxy to cultural change. Islam is a universal message, and so all cultures come within its purview. And our cultural and other differences are a sign of Allah's creative power, and the means by which we recognize each other's humanity through ta'aruf, mutual recognition. So in our context, what does that mean? Well, it means a couple of things, that no one should have to give up their culture per se to become an orthodox Muslim. Although certain practices or customs may not be in harmony with Islamic principles, but certainly conversion to Islam should not mean deculturation or adoption of another culture. Equally, migrants should not be expected to assimilate and give up their cultures entirely to belong. They have cultural rights to maintain and pass on their history, language, culture and Islamic values to their children, even as newcomers in a foreign land. Practically speaking, migrants will be bicultural in, in that they will be able to migrate to navigate the private and public spheres um, using whatever cultural register that, that, they, that they, they have mastered. And I think the final point is that obviously cultures are, are never bounded, so there will be integration and creativity and mixing over time. But what I am objecting to specifically here is the white nativist assumption that immigrants or refugees must assimilate, that it's one-way traffic, and that is a nativist de demand, it's not an Islamic one. You know, this confusion over culture and religion is, is apparent in a, num in a number of ways. First, there's the expectation that the first migrants had cultural Islam, whereas their children were rediscovering pristine, deculturated Islam, which is a myth. Actually, they were reculturing their relationship to Islam in their own unique and hybrid terms. Secondly, among white converts in particular, there has been a tendency over the decades, and let me stress that's just one tendency among many, to do the very same. In other words, to claim that they have converted to pristine classical Islam, while the immigrants are trapped in forms of cultural Islam. By this move, they claim undue authority in the question of how a new culture fit into a universal tradition. And they deny the struggles and sacrifices of pioneer generations that came to the West. You know, simply to say they migrated for worldly reasons alone, to completely leave out consideration of the colonial context out of which they came. The racist rejection, violence and discrimination they endured is for me a travesty of history. Mm. A viable, multi-ethnic, multicultural Muslim community cannot ride roughshod over each other's histories in this way. We should be compassionate, we should be careful and good listeners, and we should be willing to be open to the experiences of others. It is only through understanding and acceptance that we will come together as one community over time. With all of that said, I would observe that some key convert leaders act as conduits and provide legitimacy towards some figures attached to white nativism, or we could say that they work to soften up resistance to some, not all of its ideas. This is true, even if, if these convert leaders decisively reject a lot of what night, white nativism is about at the same time. And uh, who are we talking about here, Yahya? Okay, so in the Anglophone Islamic world of the West, you know, two key figures here are Sheikh Hamza Yusuf in America and Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad in the UK, as they have the most credibility and are the most mainstream. There are converts who are much more extreme, who advocate whites only marriage and openly support forms of white ethnocentrism, but they are also much more marginal and we shouldn't overstate their size, reach or influence, but they do exist. What makes me uneasy, to return to your question, more so in the case of, of Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, is that his engagement with populist recruiters for the radical right, like Jordan Peterson, or with an intellectual leader of it, like the late Sir Roger Scruton, who died in 2020, provide no intellectual challenge on either their own track record of Islamophobia, or their uncritical boosting of Islamophobes, like Douglas Murray or Ayad Hirsi Ali who are advocating for direct discrimination against Muslims in the West, whom they paint as an enemy within. But I would also say that Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's working directly with the Trump presidency on the Committee of Unalienable Rights, 
which was which essentially wanted to take the culture wars into US constitutional law. And this necessitated, she comes the use of taking a back seat on protesting all the other things that Trump was doing during his tenure, like his Muslim travel ban, his cruel separation of migrant children from their parents at the southern US border, and his support for an insurrectionist attempt to take over the Capitol once he had lost the election in 2020. In my reading, Trump was no ordinary president, but was the opportunistic face of a white nationalist insurgency. He is the only American president to have been impeached twice. He was not someone in whose administration a respected religious leader should serve. Yeah, I, I want to uh, understand your disagreement with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Abdul Hakim Murad in, in some more detail. I mean, I suppose their argument would be that what is wrong with that were an outreach. I mean, I watched the Hamza Yusuf and Jordan Peterson interview, and yes, I, I found it to be lacking clarity and challenge. But I suppose we meet and engage with non-Muslims all the time. And if they can reach people in positions of influence, then in a sense, this is emulating the best of the prophetic sunnah. The messenger وسلم, met with the leaders of Quraysh and the tribal chiefs around Mecca. I mean, one can argue even his meeting at Daif uh, led to what some may argue to be a humiliating outcome. And isn't their activity very much part of an age-old tradition of reaching out to people of influence. Let me say that the discussion between Jordan Peterson and um, Shikham's use was not a private chat. This was a staged event with tens of thousands of viewers. So I'm quite sure on both sides it was a strategic decision and it was not an ad hoc one. And the approach taken by Shikham's use was a soft one, which allowed Peterson, you know, to set the agenda she comes off with no challenge and doing this, knowing that it could be read by numerous Muslim followers as validation and affirmation of all of his content. But as I said before, uh, Peterson has promoted some of the most notorious Islamophobes in the Anglophone cultural sphere today. And that cannot be left. Dawa is often used as a sort of catch-all rationale for all kinds of outreach and interaction with non-Muslims. All I'm suggesting here is that we tread with caution before labelling all interactions dawa willy-nilly in this way, especially given that the whole approach of Homs Yusuf since 2001, particularly in the years after the Arab Spring, has been to get closer to the Republicans. So my, in my reading, it's mostly a political exercise, not one of dawa per se. I mean, his approach has mostly been political outreach to the Republicans, but clearly with the Republicans out of office, uh, he's gone towards a cultural approach to the, I guess, the the radical right, the American radical right. And this interview is, is part of that. Yeah, yeah, I've come across Muslims who pay a lot of attention to Jordan Peterson and those on the right, especially when it comes to social issues like abortion and uh, LGBTQ. Uh, they argue there is an overlap with Islam and those who are socially more conservative. Uh, Jordan Peterson, for example, for many years has uh, spoken to uh, young Muslims, but generally young men uh, who feel that feminism and, and the liberal left have uh, diluted their sense of masculinity. Isn't there an argument to say that uh, these characters, Roger Scruton, uh, as another example, a traditional conservative in the, in the Burkean mode, isn't there an argument to say that uh, these figures uh, have more connection with Muslim causes than those on the progressive left? I'm not an expert on Peterson in the sense that I've not made a thorough study of his output to an academic standard. And that's difficult because he's got thousands of hours of YouTube videos. So I don't know how anybody could really get their heads around that. I've followed his career and his influence on Muslim men from a distance since he came to prominence. And as you've just said, there is a separate question of gender dynamics at play here, gender identity issues in his appeal to Muslim men and men in general to become real men, as he defines it. And it clearly chimes with Muslim men. But I'm going to pass over your question here, not because it is unimportant, but because I want to look further into it before commenting and writing uh, or writing about it or taking it up in serious platforms like this. 
but but you do imply in your article that Peterson is part of this white nativism trend. Well, I mean, you know, before my piece was written and had gone to press, um, Peterson released his message to Muslims. And obviously it was received badly by nearly all Muslims. And even by some of those who previously looked up to him, they, re- they repented and, and left following him. Uh, I think we need to ask at this point, what is the point of Dao with a person who thinks Muslims are barbarians, who are always infighting, who must make peace with the country that is colonizing a Muslim land and dispossessing its people? If you want to hear the echo of dehumanizing language that Israel uses about Palestinians, you find all the same language in, Amer- in America and its ethnically cleansed indigenous peoples. The same talk of peace or breaking promises and dispossessing them of land and killing them indiscriminately indiscriminately while calling them barbarians and asserting the superiority of the West, the same language of settler colonialism, the same language that Peterson uses unabashedly in his message to Muslims. As for his place within white nativism, I see Peterson as the gateway drug to its harder forms, to those who call for direct discrimination against Muslims in the West, who champion Islamophobia, do sanction wars and bombing against Muslims abroad. He soft sells his political agenda through personal morality issues that chime with orthodox Muslim men. So I do think, I would say one thing, I do think there is an instrumentalization of personal morality issues to sell a hard, a hard Islamophobic political agenda. Uh, and we can't divorce the two issues easily in my book. And I guess that's where there could be disagreement. People say, well, you could affect a separation, but I I see it as all one package. In your article, and it, it's it's a brilliant piece, and I really advise uh, my listeners to 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 have a read. Uh, you also make reference to an ex Dutch MP, Joram van Cleveren. He's a former colleague of uh, Islam hater Geert Wilders, and uh, former member of his right wing PVV party. Uh, Joram van Cleveren converted to Islam partly, uh, I think, uh, uh, at the hands of. Uh, uh, Abdul Hakim Murad. Uh, and I remember some Muslims at the time hailing this as almost like an Omar bin al Khattab moment. Here's an influential right wing indivi- individual uh, who, after seeing uh, the truth of Islam, he converts and uh, his racism, his, his anti immigration becomes a thing of the past. Isn't this a sign of an example, actually, of the victory of engagement? Well, look, you know, let me start off by saying, of course, I'm happy that someone, anyone embraces Islam. I mean, how could I not be? So let's leave that to one side. Hmm. Um, that's not that's not that's not on the table here. What I would question is a logic that allows one to say that this is an instant of Omari conversion, i.e. that someone who is hostile to Islam who is a doughty enemy to Muslims, who converts and becomes the doughtiest protector of Muslims and later one of their greatest leaders. You know, does this conversion of Joram van Claveren, is it an Omri conversion in this sense? So in researching this article, I talked to a number of Muslim activists and Muslim intellectuals in Holland about the conversion and its impact locally. And my research drew two conclusions. Joram van Claveren's public records, and I'm happy to be corrected on this score, on immigration and refugee policies post-conversion is mixed or confusing at best. So on immigration, he said that he left the PVV because it had become too hardline, which sounds promising, right? But in another interview, he indicated that refugees should not be brought to Europe, but kept in their regions of origin. This sounds a lot like a lot like a more hardline approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's also a fan of Abdul Haki, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's Travelling Home, which I criticise in my essay for promoting the white nativist logic of the assimilation of migrants and blaming migrants and their children for creating their own problem, their own problems in a way that runs counter to the spirit of cultural, mutual cultural recognition in Surat al-Hujrat, in the concept of ta'aruf. Um, so Van Claveren is being lauded abroad in American Britain, and so I am told being funded by money from the Gulf for his Dower project. But within Holland itself, he is, this is as a result of my conversations, he's still seen as having been disconnected, as having few connections to a largely working class Muslim community and its immediate concerns around structural Islamophobia and racism. 
he sits precise nowhere, precisely nowhere in their struggle. And that's unsurprising given his background. He remains a cultural conservative by conviction. So I do not see in this a doughty defense of a beleaguered Muslim community as Omar Ibn al-Khattab, may God be pleased with him, was to the early Muslims mm. in Mecca. So you can convert to Islam yet still carry some of the prejudices that may be brought over from your former life. Well, it's not just that, is it? It's that what is the call to Islam that's been given to them? You know, in other words, we have to be unambiguous about Islam's anti-racist um, foundations. Yeah, I suppose when Omar bin Khattab, when he converted, the first act he did was to publicly rebuke the leaders of Quraysh. And, and I suppose that was an act of, of uh, separating himself from his past uh, ideas. Um, and, and maybe that's, that's part of the problem here, that uh, those many who convert to Islam still retain some of those, uh, so, some of those uh, as I call them, prejudices. But again, I think we have to look at what what call to Islam is being made to them um, as well. I mean, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to say that they are um, they have no responsibility in the matter. But I'm also suggesting we look at how are we calling them to Islam? What are we saying and not saying? I think that's a critical part of the discussion. Let's look at, for example, Abdul Hakim Murad and, and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Uh, these two public intellectual scholars uh, are part of a greater grassroots movement of projects, of seminaries and institutes that are culturally and ethnically very diverse. I mean, if you visit the Cambridge Mosque, it strikes me to be a project that involves all Muslims. How much do you think their individual mindsets reflect this cultural and ethnic superiority, I suppose, or, or can we be more charitable and say, at most, they may be acting naively, politically naively, when engaging with the likes of Jordan Peterson or Roger Scruton? Well, I agree with you that the Zaytuna College and the Cambridge Wilson College are inclusive institutions, not just culturally, but also ideologically. Um, I should have made that point clearer about Zaytuna in the piece, in the essay that I wrote, which I did for the CMC, but I I. I I didn't do it for the Zaytuna. But my view is that this, this political, or my assessment, is that this political and cultural outreach to, to white nativist radical right, it undermines that very ethos of these institutions. And given that these sheikhs are the heads of these admirable educational initiatives and mosques, and are their primary founding figures, they are tied up with the branding of these institutions. So ultimately, that is a question for them, not for me. They may think the risk can be defrayed, but as an outside observer, that's not my assessment. But as I've been arguing with you today, the risks go much wider than managing the reputation of, of this two or three Islamic institutions in the West. I mean, isn't there a difference between Abdul Hakim Murad and uh, Hamza Yusuf in, in the sense that uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, he engages with these people in a, in a private capacity? I've not seen... Again, I, I, you know, I may not have uh, followed it so closely, but I've not seen uh, any public engagement with uh, members of the white nativist trend. Whereas um, Hamza Yusuf, he engages, as you said, with the Republican Party. In fact, he sits on their forums. Uh, he is very happy to share platforms with people like Roger Scruton, who, as you know, I mean, you know, in Britain, we know him to be a, a, an out and right Islamophobe. Um, and uh, recently he, of course, uh, was, was ready to, uh, to, to engage with Jordan Peterson in a very public way. I mean, I suppose what I'm saying is that there is a difference here between private engagement and very public engagement, which borders on endorsement of some of these ideas. I mean, I, I, I take care in the piece. I mean, I think we're covering ground I already covered in, in talking about Van Claveren. Um, so let me, let me just restate that. I mean, obviously, in the essay, I make it very clear that um, Hamza Yusuf's engagement is political and cultural, okay, whereas Abdul Hakim's is cultural and has mostly been private, um, but has become public knowledge with the conversion of Van Claveren. So I'm I'm not um, I'm not saying that that we shouldn't give dower to people, but what I what I I focus on here is that it is an, the, the, the um, Umari possibility is being invoked here, that the conversion of a few 
members of the native and prominent leaders of the nativist right will create a transformation in the political situation of Muslims in, in Europe or, or America. And on that score, I'm much more skeptical for the reasons that I outlined earlier. Yeah, this, this is what I'm saying, that the, the, the idea is that there is a kind of a political benefit for an Omar of the modern age converting and that white nationalism somehow being magically diffused. What I think that that is obscuring is the fact that what is the call to Islam that's being made to them in the first place that makes them still feel comfortable to remain outside of any committed anti-racism um, effort, uh, as you referred earlier to um, uh, Omar's sort of, you know, immediate denunciation of the Quraysh. We don't see this kind of political activism on, on the part of these converts who, they still seem to remain comfortably in the conservative political um, arena in terms of, um, you know, um, some of the white nativist assumptions about migrants and the like. And I would suggest that part of that rests with the call that's been given to them. Right. And so the, the call does not sufficiently engage with address Islam as a as a as, as a theory of justice, which is which stands against racism, which stands against xenophobia, which stands against um, uh, some of the, the trends we see uh, across the West. Yeah. In, in a nutshell. Now, I may be reading too much into your article, but do you think that some white Muslim converts look upon non-white Muslim cultures with a level of disdain? I think that the the matter is subtler than you suggest. Within neo-traditionalism, and I want to speak about this movement in particular, although I don't want to suggest that there aren't similar problems with white converts in other movements. Um, but let, let, let me speak about the movement that I know best because um, I've been part of it for, for nearly three decades. You know, the, the, there is, within neo-traditionalism, there is a hierarchy of, of non-white traditional Muslim cultures that within the movement, uh, um, that the movement sees as having been least affected adversely by Western modernity. So there's a romance, if you like, of the authentic sage of the East, you know, who imparts timeless, undisturbed tradition, accessed by an accomplished translator who is only a simple mediator of this timeless tradition to the Anglophone West. So the tr tr translator in this instance is positioned as somebody who has no agency, by which I mean they have no interpretive power or political agency, but are merely acting like a relay station, changing Morse code into Latin characters. But what I'm saying to you sort of three decades into this movement, we should be more self-reflective. We shouldn't be naive. And we should accept that translation is always an interpretive act. And therefore, it's always a political act uh, in my book. Um, I'm not saying that translations could have more fidelity or less fidelity, but there are always choices involved in translations. So to, to return to your question, the top tier of non-white Muslim cultures reflects the educational histories of the uh, of the main figures of neo-traditional in, in the West. So the Ottoman world, the Maghreb, the Yemen, Egypt, Syria. As a result, there was a lack of engagement with other with forms of traditional Sunnism in other parts of the Muslim world, most significantly South Asia. So there has been disparagement of South Asian Muslim cultures and Islamic scholarship in South Asia, as well as appreciation and pragmatic engagement. So it's a mixed picture. But let us say that neo-traditionalism like Salafism or Deobandism to a lesser degree also did, provided a space for second generation South Asian Muslims in the West to dispute with their parents so-called cultural Islam in favor of authentic deculturated Islam carried largely by Arab neo-traditionalists and their Western translators. So what I'm saying is we have to put this myth of a deculturated Islam, an Islam without culture, to bed. It has outstayed its welcome, as its consequences have been divisive in my view. Instead, what we need to see, instead we need to see Ta'aruf as an invitation to have a healthy, creative relationship between our faith and our culture, and we should, rec we should accord the same courtesy to others. We should be thankful for this sign of Allah's creative power, and do not 
in our context, we can only do so if we forge a commitment to anti-racism and to a cosmopolitan outlook, culturally speaking. Look, you know, this is happening anyway in our habits of cultural consumption, but I suggest we deepen this to, be, to make it a spiritual and ethical practice. Just as a, as a clarification about that point, I mean, isn't it the case that sometimes cultures do get in the way of this anti-racism call? Um, I had a friend, you know, you live, you're a white convert, you live in Bradford. I had a friend who was a white convert. He moved to London and partly he did so because he felt that he was never accepted by some parts of the Muslim community uh, because racism was quite rife in South Asian cultures and, and uh, there was a, a reluctance to, to embrace him as part of the community. Isn't there a, a need to tackle, uh, fine, you know, those cultures as a, as a, as a whole, uh, you know, we cannot de deculturalize Islam, that's, that's fair enough, but isn't there a need to tackle some of these extreme um, ideas and, and habits that have uh, formed part of our, our cultural makeup? Well, I think that's right. Um, I agree with you. Uh, Anti-racism is a self-critical practice, first and foremost. It's not about, um, uh, like any form of muhasaba, uh, any form of self-examination. Anti-racism as a spiritual Islamic practice, you should start with yourself. Um, and, you know, that means examining our own attitudes. Um, uh, I think I, I've seen since the Black Lives Matter protests, global protests, um, you know, I've seen a lot of much more reflection and, and energy, say, amongst British Muslims of South Asian heritage about addressing anti-blackness uh, in their communities. There's a lot more movement on that now. And for decades, it was quite a dismal picture. But I, I see signs that, that this self-critique is already in play. Not that it's getting necessarily getting uh, worse, you know, that there's, there's more myopia and blindness. I think there is self-critical practice going on. And we should welcome that. I just think that every, everybody needs to do their, their homework, so whether it's white converts or, or second generation desis or whoever it is. We all have to do homework, uh, uh, you know, ethical homework uh, on ourselves. Um, I think it's important. But obviously, anti-racism is, is about structural injustice as well, not just personal ethical practice. Now, you spoke about uh, the aforementioned Muslim public intellectuals and how they can be characterized with the label neo-traditionalists, the understanding that um, they're inheritors of, of a pure Sunni tradition that revives the Sul al-Fiqh and scholarship and, and Sufi mysticism. Uh, but I think you make a really interesting point in your article that they are all also equally defined by their response to Salafism but also by the ethos of Syrian survivalist political quietism. What is quietism? Why is it problematic in your eyes when considering Islam's take on justice? Put simply, it's the politics of survival uh, in the autocratic post-colonial state. And that's been transplanted uncritically into an entirely different context, a secular democratic one of the West, where we have considerable political freedoms where, you know, I would argue, despite the pressures on us, and I, I, I don't gloss over any of those in the, in the essay, we may yet thrive, uh, not just survive. Yet the neo-traditionalist argument is that we should suffer in silence or stand aside from the great causes of injustice in our times. And we should not be naive. States like the United Arab Emirates are actively trying to undermine democratic, democratically elected Muslims in the West. And they're working with the Israelis to undermine Muslim activism in the West that is critical of undemocratic state power in the Middle East and the dispossession of the Palestinian people. And all of this freighted onto a kind of theological argument between neo-traditionalism and Salafism, whether that Salafism was quietist or activist. After the Arab Spring, the counter-revolution led by the Arab monarchies and sheikhdoms, as well as the secular Arab republics with their in-house ulama, have developed a political theology of abject submission to arbitrary state power with no room for civil society freedoms of any description. And here, the branch of Salafism called Mud Mudkhali Salafism and neo-traditionalist Islam have converged together. So to be precise, the quietism is for the Muslim masses 
we must put up with gross injustices as a spiritual practice to bear patiently with tribulations while political activism is outsourced to state-aligned ulama on behalf of the political authority whose task is to keep the masses quiet. I note that Abdul Hakim Murad has thankfully dissented from this curated form of state Islam, but I must say he's done so in a rather muted Are you asking for too much when you require that all scholars uh, should make very strong or should have very strong political positions on all issues? No, I mean, I, I think if you broach the issue, if you talk about the state control of Islam, you have to do it in a clear way. That's all I'm saying. As Abdul Hakim has raised the issue himself, um, I feel that it has to be done clearly. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't expect, you know, not all ulama have to speak out. Some can just remain engaged away from politics and focus on education and tarbiya as perfectly valid and, and a part of Sunni Islam. But there has to be some who speak out. If they're going to raise the issues, I think they should do so clearly. This is what I'm, I'm suggesting. I think you know, Yahya, that there is a, a fascination uh, with second, third generation Muslims with uh, white converts uh, who come to Islam. And, and many Muslims see that, many second, third generation Muslims see uh, that um, the only hope for Muslims in the West will come from those who are indigenous to uh, Britain, to America, who are able to convey Islam in a way that uh, is recognizable to the uh, to the majority population is there a problem with people uh, from from india from pakistan from syria having this type of uh, inclination the joy at seeing somebody convert to islam comes from faith i'm not one to deny that joy and pleasure and gratitude mm. um, it comes from from faith yes. let me carry, go on to say however that you know uh, to add also that contextual cultural knowledge, of course, that's important to Dawa. You can't be kind of culturally illiterate when you, you know, the prophets were sent to their own people. So obviously, it means that a kind of level of cultural competence is, 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 is essential. But all I would say is that, you know, as time goes on, and as a percentage of British born, let's take the example of Britain, as a percentage of British born Muslims grows, this is no longer be a relevant point because if you're born and brought up in Britain, you're, you're, you're at the very least bicultural, mm. you know, you could have competence in your heritage culture and in your culture of birth. You, you can code switch, in other words, you're conversant in both, like being bilingual. But you mentioned insecurities, and I, I do think that separate work has to be done on that. Uh, perhaps it's not really my place. As I said, we all have like our own homework to do. All I will say is that colonialism poisoned the well in the relationships between white peoples and non-white peoples, between the colonizers and the colonized, in deep ways that stretch into our times today. There's much to unlearn. Perhaps we could do it together is what I'm suggesting. If I need to dismantle the idol of white supremacy in myself, get off my pedestal, but also fight for, for justice and fairness. Maybe a desi could do some work on dismantling their own internal brown sahib. <laughs> okay, so, you know, the brown sahib, you know, was popularized by the Sri Lankan exile, um, Tazi Vatachi, who died in 1963, and he wrote a book about it. And the brown sahib was a desi who preferred English culture and customs and looked down on those of the East. Now, the brown sahib has fallen out of use but perhaps we could revive it for critical, even playful purposes. I mean, look, there are no reasons why reculturation has to be, be dour and uh, agonistic, you know, combative and contested. It can also be done creatively. It can be done with a sense of humour. Um, you know, maybe that will help us, that will make it easier for us to have these discussions with self-awareness, humility and, and, and a sense of humour, self-depreciating humour. Um, finally, I would say that dawa the idea that converts lead can own, only converts can talk only white people can convert white people to islam i mean look dao is a general calling and so ultimately it cannot be subcontracted that said converts should and could do more and i admonish myself firstly for my own deficits here 
I think you make a deeper point about Islam and justice in your article. Um, can you expand on this? How important is anti-racism and challenging, for example, Western foreign policy when it comes to Dawa in the West? And I'll make a simple point about Dawa here. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a popular argument made nowadays that Dawa should firstly be theological in nature and that effectively it should be divorced from ethics. And that argument is pr predicated on the sequential nature of the Quranic revelation over 23 years. So the argument goes that the early focus was on faith, on establishing belief in monotheism, um, in God's judgment in the afterlife. This is uncontestable in one sense, but it is misleading in another. I would ask anyone to show me that the Meccan period describes a circumstance in which monotheism is divorced entirely from ethical principles. I can't see it. Justice was always at the cornerstone of the call to Islam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, invited people of all backgrounds to Islam, including those from the margins of that chauvinistic tribal society. The Qurayshite sense of tribal superiority was never indulged. To the contrary, all believers stood equally in front of one God, or would be judged on their conduct in the world in the next. I mean, the idea that you could divorce monotheism from ethics it's all of a piece with a kind of neoliberal, neoliberalized Islam that we now see emerging, which prefers personal spiritual comfort over a struggle of justice for justice and rights. I mean, this, this leads me to anti-racism. I don't see how Muslims cannot be anti-racists. Their theology teaches that piety is the distinction of merit in God's eyes and nothing else. Not culture, not nation, not skin colour, not class, not wealth, etc. So it seems to me they are enjoined to uphold that principle in any society in which they form a part, whether as a minority or a majority. Obviously, as you mentioned earlier, we need to address internal prejudices among Muslims too, such as anti-blackness among Desis, or, or white nativism among converts, white converts to Islam, as I've been trying to do in this essay uh, and in this conversation. Um, you know, a final point I touch on the essay, I think we need to work towards anti-racism 2.0, by which I mean one that is post-secular and that allows for Muslim agency and distinctiveness. And the reason why I say this is that Western anti-racism movements largely came out of the secular left which has traditionally been uncomfortable with religious communities. In Britain, it was suspicious or lukewarm about Islamophobia and has often been obstructive to furthering it as part of a policy agenda. But there has been, the good news is, there has been a new post 9-11 generation that has grown up with structural Islamophobia through the war on terrorism as a political fact of their whole lives. So that, that, that you know, it's no, it's no longer really a denial about Islamophobia in the anti-racism movement. So part of this work towards anti-racism 2.0 would include deepening the story of race making in European history. The focus in old anti-racism movements has been upon telling the story of race from the early modern period through colonialism and transatlantic chattel slavery to its pseudo-scientific forms in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Recent work has been done, however, to push the story of race making back into medieval Christendom, where it is much more wrapped up with religious intolerance. So the relations between the curse of Ham, Adam's cursed black son, and later skin color racism, between the blood libel against Jews and modern anti-Semitism, and between Christian polemics against the Ishmaelite Saracen and later Orientalism and Islamophobia. So this deepened story would help us all to make connections between racism as it manifests in stigmatization between cultural and civilizational difference and not just bodily skin tone or phenotypical difference. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the main person working on this. I should name check the decolonial Muslim intellectual Said Mustafa Ali of the Open University in this regard and a lot more attention should be made, paid to his work on this matter. And, and that links to your concept of free tone Islam. What, what do you mean by free tone Islam? And why do you see that as a, a way to uh, assist in uh, the call to Islam? Well, for me, um, the future of Islam won't be, or let's say obviously shouldn't be indigenous or in a purist or nativist sense or white, but resolutely three tone yes. or brown, black yes. and white. Here, you know, I'm, um, I'm 
stealing a term coined by somebody else, um, Sally Wellborn, who's a grassroots activist from, from Nottingham. And my, my reflections on three-tone Islam have come out of a prolonged discussions that I've had with him. So three-tone Islam, and it's a very kind of British reference, it's a play upon the two-tone movement. For those of us old enough to remember it, it was a kind of it was a, a kind of youth movement that came up in the 70s and 80s, and it was focused on music, on fashion, and on anti-racism activism. And it came from working class black, uh, so black and white working class British youth. Why I'm referencing that is because, you know, it's all very well having intellectual discussions about all of this about anti-racism. What, what a new anti-racism could look like or what a three-tone Islam could look like. But, it, you know, we have to go beyond a public argument to faith in action to make it happen, to envision a space in which black, brown and white Muslims could come together in fellowship and service, breaking down barriers of race, culture and class. And, I, you know, I'm saying this, but I do believe there are spaces in which this is beginning to happen. And, um, and you know, so we should see like three-tone as like an opening gambit it embodies chronic process of mutual understanding and recognition through difference to Aruf, rather than some seamless perfect end product. You know, in other words, it's, it's, it's a goal to which, which we're trying to work. And Three Tone Islam recognizes um, four things. One, it recognizes that Western indigeneity isn't just white, but it's multicultural and it's open to change. Secondly, that conversion itself is three tones. So we're not talking about conversion of whites to Islam, but of whites, browns and blacks to Islam. That's the reality. Thirdly, three tone isn't meant to be a limitation. It points to a wider diversity in the ummah and in humanity. I, I'm saying to you, it shouldn't call itself three tone Islam. Okay, <laughs> it's not a net, it's not a branding exercise, yeah? It's just to get us to think differently. And the fourth point, it goes back to my earlier point, we need a post-secular anti-racism uh, anti-racism 2.0 that includes a deeper story of religious chauvinism and race making, which I talked about earlier. That's fascinating. And, and tell me about the contrast you draw between the forgotten earlier figures, two converts to Islam, uh, uh, Abdul Hadi uh, Agreli, and Lord Al Farouk Headley. Uh, yeah, tell me about that. It's a fascinating point you make about the outlook of these two individuals once they embraced Islam. Yeah, I think it's just, I mean, I think that um, one of the reasons why I'm interested in the early history of conversion to Islam uh, in Europe and Britain is because I, I kind of always want to uh, see what choices were made uh, by converts in early periods of history what choices were open to them and what choices did they take, if you see what I mean? Because quite often what we could end up doing is sort of saying, well, Islam tells me to make a particular choice in this particular moment. Whereas that's never the case. You know, they're always making different choices uh, and trying to justify them Islamically. So I, I like going back into history to kind of see what choices they made and to reflect on my own choices critically. And that's why I do it. Um, so during this kind of high noon of European colonialism, there were si very similar questions like we have today about political loyalties of Muslims and converts always get this accusation hurled at them that they're turncoats, you know, they're traitors. Um, and so it's always particularly acute for converts, um, particularly when the question of Islam is very politicized in the West. Um, there are periods when it's less politicized, but, you know, we're living in a politicized moment. So these two figures, one was, uh, was Abdul Hadi Agueli and the other was Lord Fruk Hedley. Um, so Agueli, he was a noted uh, Swedish painter. He moved in avant-garde circles in Paris with famous, you know, impressionist painters. And at that point in time, he was an anarchist. You know, he, he repudiated any form of formal state control uh, of any kind of description. He thought the state itself was the enemy. And in 1900, he was arrested for firing a revolver to stop the introduction of Spanish bullfighting into France. Um, and Spanish bullfighting is where the animal is killed at the end, you know, regardless of the outcome. So, which just was not the case. And so he did it as a kind of form of direct action to preserve animal welfare. So he converts in around 1900 and is initiated into Sufism in Egypt sometime after 1902. And he established the first branch, orthodox branch of a Sufi order in Paris in 1910. 
But after his conversion, what's interesting to me is that he married his, Suf his Sufism with radical politics. So he wrote against imperialism and he, he himself is probably the first person to coin the term Islamophobia, which he does in 1904. And he uses it to analyze the enemies of Islam. So quite clearly, he comes in with an kind of anti-imperialist kind of radical politics, anti-racist. He coins the term Islamophobia. He embraces direct action. You know, so... You know, he's one possibility. Another possibility is by Lord Farouk Headley, a very different character, a kind of natural, a, a kind of one of life's natural conservatives, an Anglo-Irish peer. He remained a, a solid empire loyalist after his conversion in 1913. He campaigned to preserve British India, where he had worked in Kashmir as an imperial engineer in the 1890s. And he was quite forceful in that campaign to, to preserve the integrity of British India. This is in the run up in the middle, you know, in the in the kind of the beginnings of the independence campaign was really taking off in India at the time. And that was quite forceful compared to his rather sort of tepid support uh, uh, protests against the breakup of the Ottoman Empire after the First World War. So I would say that, you know, here we have examples of Agoeli who, rad who, who marries principal radical politics with mysticism versus a kind of Lord Headley's rather kind of unreflective loyalism giving that a 21st century makeover. So kind of, I think I'm reflecting this and to say that, you know, neo-traditionalists, if you like, even Sufis can, can, can be quite happy with radical politics. It all depends on the choices that we make. Obviously, you know, we've been through the decade of 9-11 where radicalism has been, Muslim radicalism has been disparaged as extremist and has been stigmatized in law and in policy and in social life and has been internalized by Muslim populations in the West because they've been securitized. And obviously I'm trying to subversively suggest that we reclaim, reclaim radical in a positive sense as returning to foundational principle, the root, our root principles and trying to enact them in the world. So radical is a positive, not a negative. Um, and this is one of my ways of doing that is to look back into the past and see what other radical converts have done in the past. Um, and uh, what difference they've made. And that takes us to uh, another early convert to Islam, uh, Abdullah Quilliam. Uh, now, for my cursory reading of his life, we may see him as someone who wanted to create an indigenous British Islam, uh, possibly, uh, it, you know, it, even an Islam that was at ease with uh, the, the conservative establishment. Uh, at least that's how some would characterize his aspirations. How do we interpret this really important early figure in British Islam? I hope you'll indulge me and let me first introduce him for listeners who are unfamiliar to him. Please. Because, you know, I, I never assume that people know, they might know his name nowadays, but they still might not know much about him. So let me spend a couple of minutes just trying to sort of introduce him. So he was born in, in 1856 and dies in 1932. He's born in Liverpool. Um, and why do why do I think he's an important figure in the history of Islam in Britain? Well, firstly, you know, he's the first convert in British history to make a concerted effort to call people to Islam. So around about 250 people embraced Islam at, in, in his, at his hands in a time when Islam was viewed as heretical and dangerous or as strange and unknown. It's hard for us to imagine quite how difficult that was for him to do. His early community had stones thrown at them manure heaped on them, the prayer meetings were broken up, sometimes violently, and yet, you know, they persevered. Fatima Cates, the first female convert in that community, wrote a prayerful poem in 1892 reflecting on these early challenges. So if you allow me to just quote a little bit of her poetry. So she writes in 1892, beset by numerous foes, concealed along the way, we must those enemies oppose and ever work and pray. So that just gives you a kind of a little in, little feeling for what, what the sort of the conditions under, strenuous conditions under which they worked. And so the second why, reason for me, while Quilliam is an historical figure, is that he founds Britain's first attested mosque community, the Liverpool Muslim Institute, in the summer of 1887. In many ways, this multi-ethnic Muslim community comprised of converts, as well as sailors, travellers, and notables moving in and out of Britain's great port of Liverpool. This community was ahead of its time. It fed the local poor, it provided free adult education, 
It established an orphanage, the Medina home in 1896. It provided legal representation for Muslim sailors mistreated by the shipping companies. It ran political campaigns, local, national and international on issues of concern to Muslims. It published a journal and a newspaper distributed to over 80 na nations. It developed a pan-Islamic network that stretched from Australia to America. And news of its affairs were reported weekly in Cairo, Istanbul, Bombay and Rangoon. At times, Quilliam was unafraid to be critical of British imperial expansion, such as into the Sudan in the 1890s, and he issued a fatwa condemning any Muslims who would aid the British against their fellow believers. Your question goes, now that I've introduced him, your question is how, how should we assess Quilliam? I, I would, I think it's a bit controversial. I would discourage a hagiographical approach in favour of warts and all, but with the eye of charity to circumstances and context. So I understand, let me say, I understand the hagiographical impulse to find pristine roots for Islam in Britain when our community is being constantly vilified. But for many of the same similar reasons that I've discussed earlier in this interview, I think we should resist that impulse for reasons I should elaborate a little bit on. So I was drawn to research Quilliam and his community further because I thought there was more to be uncovered than previous scholars had found. There were several unanswered questions about him and his community. To that end, I spent quite a lot of time working with other sources outside of his own publications, not just in English, but also in Urdu, Arabic, Farsi and Ottoman Turkish with the assistance of other scholars, um, notably Riordan McNamara and Munira Zeynep Maksudulu. It is important not only to see Quilliam as he presented himself, but how others saw him too. The research that I've done uh, with others um, shows that among the Muslims of the day, Quilliam had his critics as well as his supporters. L let me take an example of an Ottoman traveller that we worked on. Uh, we worked on a translation of a travelogue called Liverpool Musamandari or Islam in Liverpool, which was published last year through Claritas Press. Um, it, it cast new light on the early Liverpool Muslims and it caused a stir amongst them. And the book itself was eventually banned by the Ottoman authorities in 1898. The, the, the Ottoman traveller was a journalist and travel writer, Yusuf Sami Asmai, who started a pro-Ottoman newspaper in Cairo in 1889. He was quite fiercely anti-British and wanted the Ottomans to reassert authority over Egypt after it become a British protectorate. Asmai's account is witty and engaging and looks at his, based on his 33 day stay in Liverpool. And we meet through his eyes, we meet an extraordinary cast of characters, not least Quilliam himself, who lies at the center of Asmai's critique of the Institute. So Asmai's travelogue throws up three issues that resonate with today's Muslims. The first is how much can conversion to Islam be a process of gradual adaption rather than an instant adoption of the expectations of quote unquote born Muslims. After all, Quilliam was largely self-taught from meager resources and his community faced familiar questions. What I mean by that is familiar questions today about their adoption of an Anglo-Islamic synthesis for Protestant liturgical forms. Uh, the second is, second issue that Asmai's travelogue throws up is where do British Muslims stand regarding the politics of Ummah and the politics of nation? And for Quilliam's community, this wasn't yet a post-Caliphate question, but the debate about dual loyalties then provides an instructive mirror for our debate about dual loyalties now. And the third and final question for me that Asmai's travelogue throws up is how do we respond if we find out that our religious leaders are not the role models we would like them to be. So Asmai's account questions Quilliam's fitness as a religious leader in ways that fascinatingly echo the Me Too movement. I'm not going to go into the detail of what those, what Asmai's uh, kind of allegations are, but, but I think it throws up a similar quandary. You know, if you've relied on somebody as a kind of hero, inspiration, a mentor figure, what do you do when they let you down? Do you allow it to shake your faith or do you take the good that you took from them, um, pray for them, try to, to try to uh, guide them in the manner, matter in which they've gone wrong? Um, 
or leave them if you have to. Um, you know, how do you cope with that? You know, and so, you know, we, of course, you need to respect Olama and we need to respect scholars, but not with a kind of blind loyalty that writes them a blank check. Uh, you know, we need a mature relationship with, it, with religious leadership, whether that's today or historical figures. Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, we, that we then demonize them either. You know, um, we have to recognize the good that we've gotten from them, even if they turn out to be all too human and flawed like all of us are. So this is the reason why I prefer warts and all history with the eye of charity, because reviewing the arguments back then amongst Muslims allows us to reflect critically on our arguments now with an enhanced appreciation for the differences then and the possibilities that we have now going forward. But I must invite you back on to talk at more length in, in this discussion about Abdul Qalim. I think there's there's a lot to unearth there. Uh, but Jazakallah Khair for your time today. And uh, I think you've raised some really interesting points. Jazakallah Khair. Jazakallah Khair. Thank you for having me. And I'm the first one who's in need of correction, inshallah. Um, and all advice is, is firstly directed towards myself.